business. Uh, the next item of business is portfolio questions. Number one, Ross Thompson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it reached its estimate of £150 million annual running costs for the new Social Security Agency. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the executive summary of the outline business case for the Social Security Agency in Scotland, which was published on the Scottish Government website on the 27th of April 2017, contains a full explanation. Further detail is also contained in the main content of this document at chapters 2, 5 and 9 and technical annex B. And I forgot to say the usual mantra, short questions, short answers, <laughs> so I, I accept that that was required. Ross Thompson. Thank you. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, I note that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance at committee uh, conceded that the cost of delivery of the 11 devolved benefits will be greater than the present cost. Uh, when quizzed by my colleague Adam Tompkins on this, Mr Mackay was unable to elaborate on the increased cost. Therefore, can, no, the, Cabinet Secretary, yes, quickly, yes, uh -huh. can the Cabinet Secretary explain whether the Scottish Government has quantified this increased cost and exactly what it will be? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance conceded no such thing, but of course it's on the official record what he did and did not say uh, at Finance Committee. Um, can I uh, point out to the member that the agency running costs uh, will be around 5% uh, of what we spend on the benefits, and the comparable figure for DWP is actually 6.3%. Now, the running costs are estimates from a cost model uh, using activity-based information uh, from the Department of Work and Pensions. And the Minister, Jean Freeman, in her statement uh, not that long ago said that these figures would, of course, be further refined uh, in terms of the, the more nuanced, detailed design of the system. Uh, of course, any policy choices we choose to make uh, and, of course, the location uh, of the agency. But I think given our running costs, are estimated at around 5%. That shows that our figures are credible, uh, they're comparable with the UK Government and their value for money. Alison Harris, question two. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the guidance on what constitutes a dangerous building. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government does not provide guidance on what constitutes a dangerous building. Local authorities are responsible under the Building Scotland Act 2003 to deal with buildings that they consider to be dangerous. Local authorities also have powers to deal with buildings they consider to be de defective. Alison Harris. Thank you. Has the Scottish Government made any consideration for buildings that, whilst are not deemed dangerous, are derelict and in a state of major repair, and that need security mon monitoring to perhaps keep children out who are putting themselves at risk? I don't feel it's that, you know, whilst I appreciate... That's fine. Thank you. Got your question, <laughs> Minister. Okay, thank you. As I said in my initial answer, um, presiding officer, it's up to local authorities themselves uh, to decide whether a building is dangerous or defective uh, and to take the necessary actions that they feel that they, they need to take with the legislation that is in place to do so. Question three, Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will encourage the uptake of all the devolved benefits to which people might be entitled. Uh, Minister, is Cabinet Secretary, sorry. Sign officer. Uh, Social Security is a human right and we are determined to support everyone to claim all the benefits to which they are entitled to. There are a range of reasons why people do not claim such support and it's disappointing, if not surprising, that the UK Government has taken no recent action to improve take-up. Making sure that everyone receives the financial support they are entitled to is one of the first steps towards putting dignity and respect at the very heart of Social Security in Scotland. We have made a clear commitment to do all that we can to maximise family income, a key method of tackling poverty. As part of this commitment and over the course of this parliamentary term, we will deliver a programme of activity to increase uptake of Social Security by encouraging people to exercise their rights and claim the benefits that they are due. Adam Topkin. The government made of the effectiveness of the. I beg your pardon. I'm whizzing on. Quite right. You look frowning at me. Uh, yes, Alison Johnson. You see, I'm out of practice at this one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Um, today, the Scottish Parliament becomes responsible for a range of benefits, including DLA and carers' allowance. And many of these benefits have complicated interactions with one another and making it even more difficult for people to understand their entitlement 
And when someone does not... Or is no, no, able, let's have a question. OK, what I'd like to understand is what work is underway to review how the benefits being devolved interact with one another and what steps are being taken to make this complicated system easier to navigate. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, indeed, President Officer. We know that the current system uh, is currently uh, complex and therefore uh, a very important uh, point uh, for the Scottish Government to help people navigate their way through that complexity is indeed to ensure that our new Social Security Agency has that duty to maximise incomes. Uh, and also the role of the Scottish Government experience panels uh, is very important here. That will help us uh, know uh, and evaluate uh, what works in terms of encouraging people to take up the benefits that they are entitled to, uh, whether those are reserved benefits uh, or devolved benefits. Uh, and as I uh, said in my closing remarks in yesterday's debate, we will indeed uh, have a round table uh, with our partners and, and local government, um, ensuring that the work that we do over the piece uh, of the this parliamentary term um, is consistent uh, and that is both broad brush and targeted uh, to people who, who need advice. Adam Tompkins now, please. Thank you. Yesterday, I was confused with Jeremy Balfour, now with Alison Johnson. I think that's probably progress. But the, um, my question is, um, what, what assessment has the uh, government made of the effectiveness of the campaign it ran in March um, of a week-long series of radio and uh, press adverts to highlight the range of support uh, available to claimants? Cabinet Secretary. It's a fair point, uh, presiding officer. As the member will know that uh, the campaign in March was just phase one. It was a broad brush campaign uh, to support the general take-up of, of benefits. Uh, the press activity uh, had the potential to reach over uh, a million people. Uh, the radio uh, activity had the potential also uh, to reach uh, 1.3 uh, million people. Uh, and we know from the Citizens Advice Bureau that they have had an increase in casework inquiries and indeed website activity. Uh, but in terms of that more detailed uh, nuanced analysis uh, of impact, that work is still going on. Kenneth Gibson. Presiding officer, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what the value of the unclaimed devolved benefits uh, is that the UK Government has failed to encourage the take up of? Cabinet Secretary. Um, it is quite difficult to get um, accurate information in relation to uh, benefits that will be devolved, but what we know uh, over the piece in terms of uh, benefits, income replacement benefits, and child tax uh, benefits in particular, that uh, there are more than uh, half a million individuals and families who are not claiming uh, what they are entitled to. Now that gives uh, an onus on the Scottish Government to do more, but it begs big questions uh, about what the UK Government is doing uh, to increase uptake uh, of uh, benefits that they uh, oversee, but also uh, the, the, the tax system as well. Question four, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment has been made of the impact that an increased carer's allowance will have, would have on disability poverty. Minister. <clears throat> Thank you. The aim of the increased carer's allowance, as the member knows, is to recognise the vital contributions carers make to society. We are currently assessing the impact of this policy on other groups, along with other policies, including disabled people, through our equality impact assessments. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer. Now that both the powers of top up and powers to make changes to disability benefits have been devolved and in, indeed commence in this chamber, we have the powers to legislate and improve the lives of carers across Scotland. I take a keen interest in this as a co convener of the cross party group for carers. Before we get to no, carers. No, before you go on, I want a question. Right, before we get to carers week. No, I want a question. <laughs> Uh, can the Minister give carers in Scotland greater clarity on the payment of the increased car carers allowance as to when and how this will be paid and whether she has considered uh, the possibility of backdating to September to reflect when the powers of top up were devolved? Minister. I, I thank the member for that additional question. As she rightly says, we now have to bring the legislation to this Parliament in order to give us that legal framework on which to make those additional payments in this area and in others. We will do so before the summer recess. Uh, we are considering uh, how we will make those additional uh, top-up payments and in a way that we can do that, if possible, sooner then we might take full responsibility for the whole carer's allowance. And in that, we will use the views and experience of our, ex our experience panels and of our expert group. And of course, if the cross-party group has additional comments it wants to draw to my attention, I'd be very happy to receive those. Question five, Anna Sarwar. The Scottish Government, by what date the next phase of its benefit update campaign will begin, how long the phase will run, 
and who the target audience will be. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we will have a, a rolling programme of activity over the course of the parliamentary term. Uh, the next phase will be focused on young carers. Uh, during Carers Week, which runs from 12th to 18th of June, we will be taking action to ensure young carers are aware of the benefits available to them and to encourage take-up. Uh, we are also working in partnership with Young Scot Carers Trust Scotland and a wide range of stakeholders uh, who will support uh, this activity. Uh, we all know that carers and young people play a crucial role uh, in our society and it's vitally important that we support them in looking after the people they care for, uh, which can often be in very challenging circumstances. Anna Sarwar. I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome the comments she's made about young carers. Uh, indeed, she'll be already aware of my disappointment at the level of investment of the last campaign which I raised with the Minister for Social Security recently. Across Scotland, up to £2 billion in benefits are going unclaimed, and that includes half a billion of tax credits to over 100,000 uh, Scots. Uh, has she considered the options available around co-location of benefit services? For example, for every pound spent advising, it's estimated that £39 is delivered in additional benefits. Uh, can she look to use a GP contract process to look at general practice as being a possible location for co-location of benefit advice services. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank uh, Mr Sarwar for his question. He is, of course, aware that in terms of the phase one of the campaign, we have made uh, a modest value for money investment, uh, but our investment in benefit take-up uh, campaigns will increase over the lifetime of this Parliament uh, and will indeed uh, amount to uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds. I think the issue about co-location uh, is very important. That could be something that we could pick up in terms of our roundtable discussions with our partners in local government and elsewhere uh, in terms of how we work together to increase uh, take-up. Uh, he raises some issues that we could indeed uh, ask health ministers to discuss uh, with uh, those who engage uh, with GPs. But certainly uh, that issue of co-location, um, of people being able to get advice uh, where they currently access public services, I think is a point well made. It features in the work that we're doing in and around Social Security, but also our advice services review. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm how much benefit uptake campaigns have cost thus far and uh, what the Scottish Government has done to ensure value for money in their delivery? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we're working very hard to ensure uh, delivery and value for money. The Broadbrush uh, phase one of the campaign was a modest investment of uh, £6,000. As I said in my answer to Mr Sarwar, uh, that investment will increase uh, to uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of pounds. But of course it begs the question that while uh, we in the Scottish Government are prepared to invest in benefit take-ups campaigns, given that we have half a million households, half a million families who are not getting what they are entitled to, it of course begs the question why we have no activity from the UK Government. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Further to the, the previous questions and answers, can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber of what work it's aware that of the UK Government actually carrying out to increase the uptake of benefits that people are entitled to and are not currently claiming? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I'm not aware of any recent work undertaken by the UK Government uh, to increase benefit uptake, uh, which is both uh, disappointing but perhaps not unsurprising. Question six, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how many planning appeals determined under ministerial direction in the last year have been contrary to local development plans. Minister. Presiding officer, nine planning appeals were determined under ministerial direction in the last year. Seven of the appeals determined were for development contrary to the relevant development plan, and of these, two were approved. Mark Ruskell. I thank the minister for that response. I mean, I hope he acknowledges that public confidence in the planning system will be low, where communities have spent years working on local development plans only to have decisions that were in line with those local development plans overturned. Can I ask the Minister why it's taken so long to determine the controversial appeal on the Park of Keir development, given that it's been nine months since the public inquiry concluded and nearly five months since the report landed on his desk? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, this is a complex planning application uh, and ministers are currently giving full and proper consideration to it. Every effort is being made to issue the decision as soon as possible. Question seven. Sorry, Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Church Census 2016, which estimates that the number of churchgoers will have more than halved between 2000 and 2025. Minister. 
President Officer, uh, freedom of religion and of the choice to worship is an important right in our society and the Scottish Church Census paints a useful picture of how this right is being exercised. Whilst it is not for the Scottish Government to express a view on how individuals choose to exercise their faith, uh, we will continue to engage with Scotland's different faith communities uh, to understand their issues and listen to their concerns. In relation to this, we would be very happy to meet with the Church and Society Council and others uh, to discuss the particular issues raised by the Scottish Church Census. Donald Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary for her answer. She'll be aware that the report suggests that Christian denominations are seeing falling church attendances. Given the importance of all faiths to the well-being of people and society, what support can the Scottish Government offer to all faith groups at this time? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, uh, Scotland is indeed a country with a, a strong sense of social justice and faith communities, uh, including Christian communities, but actually all faith communities in Scotland are a key part uh, to this. Um, in terms of the uh, support uh, that we uh, give to faith communities, um, we support uh, interfaith work uh, and actually Scotland is a, a world leader uh, in interfaith work and that interfaith uh, dialogue uh, and relations is crucially important to uh, community cohesion and ensuring that we continue to have good uh, community cohesion and it's imperative that given the, the challenges that we uh, face you know collectively in a society that there is that mutual understanding and respect uh, and that as we know has become more important in, in recent times our Promoting Equalities and Community Cohesion Fund um, supports interfaith work, uh, but our broader third sector work um, also supports some of the issues that our faith communities uh, are very active in, in terms of social justice, uh, whether that's around uh, food justice would be uh, a very uh, good example in terms of the work uh, that all faiths have been doing in that area. Yes, can I remind everyone I, I quite like shorter answers and shorter questions. Number eight, Kenneth Gibson. That was a rebuke to you, Mr Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the impact of its welfare reforms on communities in North Ayrshire. Minister. Thank you. The Scottish Government has repeatedly called on the UK Government to halt its welfare reform programme. Specifically, we have called for an immediate stop to the rollout of both personal independence payments and universal credit, as well as an end to the sanctions regime until the issues of hardship and stress caused by these policies are dealt with. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. It would have been good to have more specifics on North Ayrshire, but uh, does the Minister agree with evidence given to this Parliament by Professor Steve Fothergill of Sheffield Hallam University that Tory social security cuts had, and I quote, no relationship with employment growth and that the evidence provides little support for the view that welfare reform is having important and positive impacts on the labour market in Scotland? And does she acknowledge that, in fact, £540 per uh, working age That's adult a long, is being long taken question. from Sorry, the North Minister, Ayrshire economy Minister. as a result of these reforms. Thank you. Um, I, I do acknowledge both that figure. The figures that I have seen range from between 380 to 540 pounds per person in North Ayrshire, removed uh, as a result of uh, the welfare reforms. All of which, of course, is part of the one billion removed by uh, the UK government from people in Scotland in the welfare reforms introduced between 2015 and 2020, on top of the 1.4 billion that had already been taken up until that point. And I do absolutely agree with the member that there is no sustainable evidence that any of these welfare reforms are either reducing the national debt, which is itself increasing, or assisting more people into employment. Question nine, Monica Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I draw members' attention to my register of interest as a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute and a former South Lanarkshire councillor to ask the Scottish Government whether it will withdraw the planning consent that it issued in August 2015 for an incinerator facility at White Hill in Hamilton. Minister. Scottish ministers do not propose to use their revocation powers in this case. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for his short answer. It will be no surprise to him that I am disappointed and my constituents will also be disappointed and very angry. The Deputy Presiding Officer wants short questions, so I simply ask why. 
Minister. Uh, I met with uh, Ms Lennon last year and at that meeting I pointed out to her um, that any revocation of planning permission would be for South Lanarkshire Council in the first in instance. Uh, Ms Lennon has already pointed out that she was a member of South Lanarkshire Council at that point. I, I wonder if during her tenure there that she actually moved for re revocation of this planning ap application. Morris Golden. Incinerator capacity is projected to increase 12 times in the next five years. So this will mean councils might be contracted to both burn and recycle the same waste, which clearly cannot happen. Will the Scottish Government consider a moratorium on new incinerator construction? Minister. Um, as the member is well aware, um, it would be ill-considered of me as planning minister uh, to talk about any uh, applications which, which may be forthcoming. Um, I think in terms of the general policy uh, regarding uh, energy from waste, his question would be best uh, directed to the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment and Rural uh, Environment. Question 11, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether there are plans for, acts for the access to elected office funds Scotland to be open to disabled people wishing to be nominated for the 2017 general election. Minister. Thank you. Because all aspects of election to the House of Commons are reserved, the 2016 Scotland Act prohibits us from using our fund to provide assistance to disabled candidates in the general election. The UK equivalent of the fund ended in 2015 when the Conservative Party came to power and repeated calls to reopen it have gone unheeded. Colin Beattie. Given the success of the fund at the most recent local elections, helping 39 disabled candidates to take part and for 12 to ultimately be elected, does the Minister not agree that this type of funding levels the playing field between a disabled and non-disabled candidate? And would she join me in calling on the UK Government to reopen the UK equivalent fund? Minister. I thank the member for that follow-up. Actually, more importantly than either Mr Beattie or myself, uh, myself, the, the candidates, those individuals who used our fund uh, to uh, stand in the most recent local council elections themselves say, and the organisations, including Inclusion Scotland, who monitor and deliver that fund on our behalf, all say that the fund acts significantly to level the playing field. So I think it is proving itself to be successful. We will continue it for the Holyrood elections. And as we said yesterday, we are now looking at how we might use uh, that fund and that approach in terms of other areas of public life. And I'm very happy to continue our calls to the UK government to follow our example. Question 12, Gordon Lindhurst. Hmm. To ask the Scottish Government what safeguards are in place to protect communities that are in close proximity to extensive building works. Minister. Thank you. A range of safeguards are in place to protect communities from the impact of extensive building works in their vicinity, including planning, environmental health, building standards and environmental protection regulations. Gordon Inhurst. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. I've been contacted by a constituent living in close proximity to Donaldson School in Edinburgh, which is currently undergoing extensive building works. There are concerns about levels of dust pollution, adverse effects on people's health in the surrounding area. Will the Minister commit to looking into this issue alongside the Cabinet Secretary for Health and other government departments in order to find a solution to this problem? Minister. I would suggest that um, Mr Lindhurst contacts Edinburgh City Council um, to get them to check what is going on at that site. Um, I, I would imagine uh, that that would be helpful uh, to his constituent. Uh, the council itself uh, has the ability to take action if there is anything improper going on at that site. Question 13, Gillian Martin. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to increase the availability of affordable housing in the northeast of Scotland. Minister. We continue to make significant increases to our investment in building more affordable housing in the North East. Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Councils were allocated £12 million and £19 million respectively for their affordable housing programmes in 2017-18 
which in itself equates to approximately double the resources allocated in 2015-16. The Aberdeen City deal also includes £20 million of infrastructure funding commitment from the Scottish Government to unlock housing sites and a five-year certainty on £130 million of affordable housing grant. Gillian Martin. I thank the Minister for that answer. As the Minister knows, high house prices in the North East have an impact on filling vacant posts in the public sector. Can the Minister advise me of any schemes that are ongoing to prioritise availability of affordable homes for those working in the public sector? Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government have uh, provided an additional £8 million to support a 124-unit key worker housing project on surplus public sector land at the former Craig Inches prison in Aberdeen, which is due for completion in March 2018. Public sector workers who provide a, an essential service, including NHS staff and teachers in particular, um, will benefit uh, from this offer. Also in the pipeline is the Scottish Government funded 100 unit housing project at Burnside in Aberdeen where NHS staff will also be prioritised and I'm sure that uh, Miss Martin will be heartened as I was uh, to go to Inverurie uh, last week and to see some of the new housing, social housing development there by Grampian Housing Association which I think was welcomed by all of the new tenants. Question 14, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what response it has received from the third sector to the comment by the Minister for Social Security that the private sector should not be involved in assessment for Scotland's benefits. Minister. Thank you. We have received a very positive response from across the third sector, including Poverty Alliance, Child Poverty Action Group, Inclusion Scotland and the, Council, the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. We have also received a number of positive responses directly from individuals with disabilities and our statement was additionally welcomed by the Public Service Union. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister believe that the model of assessment the Scottish Government will set up will be better able to deal with mental health conditions and fluctuating conditions of claimants than is currently the case under the reserved UK system? Minister. It is certainly our intention that that will be the case and we are working with the Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group uh, and in particular with the assistance of Dr Alan McDevitt who chairs the BMA's GP group to work with other health professionals and those in the social care sector to devise for us a much uh, quicker and fairer uh, assessment process which will allow better decisions to be made first time and will allow us to use those with the relevant clinical, medical or social care experience to conduct any assessments that might be required relevant to the condition of the individual concerned. That should, and it is our intention that it will, address the particular def deficiencies in the current system, uh, particularly around mental health, fluctuating conditions and uh, other matters where people from the expert uh, panels, from the experience panels and from our consultation made very clear to us they wanted to see improvements. Question 15, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent figures that suggest the Scottish Welfare Fund has supported more than 241,000 households with awards totalling £124 million. Minister. It is uh, correct to say that since 2013-14 we've invested £190 million in the Scottish Welfare Fund, helping over 241,000 individual households, a third of which include children. And providing this vital lifeline for people of Scotland is of course the right thing to do for any caring and compassionate government. But it is wrong that Scottish uh, people in Scotland and this government have to continue to use our resources to paper over the increasing levels of hardship and crisis faced by people in Scotland as a result of the UK government's ideologically driven welfare agenda. Linda Fabiani. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and ask if the Minister does share my concern that this number and money will in fact rise uh, due to the six week minimum built-in delay in first payment under the UK government's universal credit system. Minister. There is indeed growing evidence that the uh, six-week delay, the built-in six-week delay of a minimum in terms of universal credit's first payment is producing additional hardship. And I know that my colleague, uh, Mary Todd from uh, the Highlands, has raised this matter uh, 
on a number of occasions and indeed on Monday I myself will be talking to folks in Inverness about precisely that problem. That then does produce additional pressures on our welfare fund and we have made specific additional uh, resource uh, allocations there to try and assist that. But the bottom line always remains that the problem lies at the source, which is the UK government's welfare agenda, their cuts, which they tell us are there to help manage the sound management of public finances in a situation where the public debt continues to rise and is now, I believe, somewhere around £1.8 trillion. Question 16, Ruth Maguire. To ask the Scottish Government how many households in Scotland will be affected by the changes to child tax credits that were introduced on the 6th of April. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, the Scottish Government remains deeply opposed to the UK Government's two child tax credits cap. By 2020 21, around 50,000 Scottish households will be negatively affected, impacting on those who can least afford it and pushing more and more families into poverty. Ruth Maguire. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask what response, if any, they've had from the UK Government in relation to the Scottish Parliament's decisive vote opposing the two-child cap and the rape clause? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, President Officer, I have to advise the, the Chamber that we've had no response uh, from the UK Government at all. Uh, as we all know, the rape clause is a, a fundamental uh, violation of human rights. It's disgraceful that despite serious concerns raised in this Chamber uh, and a wide range of organisations, including Rape Crisis Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid, as well as the Royal College of Nursing, that the UK Government uh, refuses uh, to reverse this shameful policy. Question 17, Marie Todd. To ask the Scottish Government whether it's received a res response from the UK Government to its late request to halt the rollout of universal credit in Scotland, following reports that the new system is pushing more people into hardship and debt. Minister. Regrettably, the Secretary of State did not respond directly to the Cabinet Secretary's request to halt the rollout of universal credit. He has sent a five-page report selling, extolling the virtues of universal credit, which itself confirmed that the UK government has no intention of halting the rollout. Marie Todd. The Minister is aware that universal credit is causing real hardship to individuals in the Highlands. In addition, arrears are causing real hardship to the local council and the housing associations find themselves in the unenviable position of pursuing tenants through the courts for debt that is not of their own making. Does the Minister agree with me that the situation is completely unacceptable and must be halted? Minister? Yes, I do. I think the evidence is stacking up by the day that the rollout of universal credit, in particular the built-in six-week delay, for which I can not yet find any reasonable or credible explanation, is in particular causing additional hardship for individuals. We will ourselves aim with the uh, support of the DWP to apply our particular flexibilities, which will allow direct payment of rent to landlords and the uh, choice of uh, twice weekly payments. But even that does not get us over the six week delay. And again, uh, we would ask the UK government to seriously consider halting the rollout of universal credit until the serious issues of hardship that it is imposing and bringing on families in Scotland are considered properly. Thank you, Minister. Question 18, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when its officials last met with Atos Healthcare. Minister. Scottish Government Social Security officials met with Atos Healthcare on the 5th of April this year to obtain an understanding of how their Atos views the PIP assessment process currently operating in Scotland. There are no plans to meet again. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank the Minister for the answer. Will the Scottish Government at this stage rule out any involvement, any involvement with Atos in the design and delivery of the new Scottish social security system? Minister. I thank the member for that question. I believe I have already done so in the statement I gave to Parliament on the new social security agency. We made very clear there that we see no place in the assessment of benefits for private sector companies. I've come to question 19. The member is not here, but no doubt there will be, I hope, a good reason which will be given to the presiding officers for her not being present. Question 20, John Mason. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and congratulate you on getting to question 20, which I was not uh, particularly anticipating. To That's ask the what Scottish you must Government never what do it's... in here is take things for granted, Mr. Lees. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the outcome of the local government elections. Minister. Presiding Officer, Scottish Ministers congratulate all councillors elected and welcome the role they fulfil for their communities. Uh, we're delighted that the local government elections were conducted successfully and that the election turnout at 46.9% was higher than the 39.6% in 2012. We look forward to working with Scotland's democratically elected councils to take forward our priorities for the people of Scotland. John Mason. Thank the minister. I thank the Minister for that answer. The, there was considerable effort put into encouraging uh, people to mark their ballot papers, one, two, three, four, uh, etc. However, on looking at a number of the papers that were uh, apparently spoilt, it appeared that a lot of them had either two or three X's on them for the parties that had put up multiple candidates, thus these were spoilt. Has the Minister any suggestions how we can tackle this problem, either by way of education or, or some other way? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Electoral Commission already runs information campaigns to inform voters about how to cast their vote. Uh, in particular, uh, a leaflet is delivered to every household before any election which gives detailed guidance on how to cast your vote at that particular poll. In addition, uh, an explanation on how to vote is sent out with every postal ballot pack and large print explanatory notices are exhibited in every polling station. So information on how to vote is available wherever a, a, a ballot paper is being completed, uh, whether it's in the home or at the polling station. Anyone who is unsure about how to vote uh, can also contact the returning officer's office to ask for advice and polling station staff are also available to help if necessary. Graeme Simpson. Um, the SNP got 32% of the vote, the same as in 2012. It has flatlined. Labour was down in vote share and numbers of seats. But I would like extra, a question rather than a party political broadcast. An extra 161 seats up 12%. Would, would the Minister agree with me that the real winners were the Scottish Conservatives? I think I can guess this answer, Mr Stewart, but go ahead. Uh, no, I would not agree. Um, there, there, was, there was only one winner in last week's Scottish elections, Scottish Council elections, and that was the SNP. We had the largest amount of votes cast, the largest amount of councillors, and of course, we are the largest party on 16 councils and joint largest uh, in three others. Uh, we won in the four main cities, uh, and, you know, uh, let's be honest with you. Um, the, there can only be one winners in elections. It was not the Scottish Conservative Party. It certainly wasn't the Scottish Labour Party. Those that polled the most were the SNP. Thank you. And that concludes uh, that concludes portfolio questions. And we're moving on to the next item of business. And I'll let the front benches get themselves organised.